everyone. Welcome to another American TESO Presents Free Friday Webinars. I'm your hostess, Shelly Sanchez Terrell, and we're here every other Friday. So you can invite uh, friends, you can show them recordings, because all of that is free thanks to AmericanTESO.com. At American TESO, you can get certifications for teaching um, English um, TESOL Advanced. You can get TESOL uh, cert certification. You can also get um, for teaching business English, teaching young learners, and this is recognized around the world if you want to be an English language teacher. So um, we have face-to-face -face, and then we also have online courses. Uh, one that I designed was the ESL Tech one for teaching English at technology. So um, today we're going to talk about presenting at conferences because part of any teacher's journey is usually attending conferences. Um, that's great for professional development. It's great for meeting face to face. And it's really great for also um, having the ability to develop a PLN and connect. But another part of this is also uh, with conferences, you eventually you might feel excited and you might want to share. And if you do want to share, then um, and, and you go through the process of you know, sending an abstract, a proposal, and all of this, then it's important that, you know, um, you're able to make the most out of this presentation. And the reason I say that, I've presented literally over 100 times in um, over 20 countries and online several times. So this is what I've found to be quite successful through my many, many times of experience, what works, what doesn't work, and I, I think that it's really important. First of all, it's important to know that it's the success of your presentation. Um, if you want to know, okay, if you know, you might feel okay at the end of it. I did a good job. I feel good about it. You know, um, but really, what makes the success is not necessarily how you feel about it. It's what someone receives. So even if one person in the audience is really sheared up or inspired or um, is able to use the knowledge that you've shared in some way, then that's a, then we consider that a success and a win. Of course, you always want to look on how to improve yourself and do better. And that's what I'm here for today, to really talk about you know, what are the important parts of a conference. I didn't put anything about the actual abstract, um, but what I would suggest for that, if you are talking about that, I'll talk about that in a minute. But among um, many scholars and research and experts in the field, what they consider to be, so after you're accepted, and we'll talk about getting accepted, um, you know, uh, I can talk about that too, because I do evaluate, I do help a lot of different individuals get accepted into conferences. Um, so this is exactly what I think is um, really good for when you're accepted. Now, Peggy George asked a good question. Do you think these strategies and tips are important for virtual presentations as well? Yes, some of them are. And so this one, which tends to be the number one for all of them, is passion. And I think that is especially important because it doesn't matter if you make any mistakes. It doesn't matter if you say, uh, uh. It doesn't matter, and I know for a lot of English language teachers, if your accent is different, if you didn't um, pronounce all of the words in English correctly, especially if you're presenting in another language, um, your passion will get you far. And I can say this because presenting so many times a year, um, virtual and face-to-face, -face, I make a lot of mistakes because I don't always have the chance to 100% prepare for every, I present two or three times a week. And with that many, sometimes more, five times, 10, depending if I'm at a conference or a workshop, sometimes at a conference, I'll present seven times or more within that particular conference. And so uh, when I present, it's not that I can make 100% uh, you know, perfect presentation seven times, but what does get me by is passion. And that's actually why I'm here at American Tea. So I've been here for, I think now seven to nine years is because I think that they pretty passionate and excited about my pro, um, what I'm presenting. And so that's, it's not necessarily that your passion is going to be that you have to be passionate about everything. But what a lot of research shows is that if you're so interested and excited about your 
topic, then you're able to really show that, you know, your enthusiasm, how it's helped you. And if you believe that what you're presenting really helped, then your audience will get that from you. And it's hard to fake that. So, um, you know, whatever you present, make sure that it's something that you do feel is helpful. And that'll carry you very far, even if you make mistakes. So that's the number one that I saw in several articles and research that really showed that. Um, I love the, and I actually had a presentation in, uh, where with Deepak Chopra. I actually happened to. Uh, present with him at one of the 140 conferences. He was the keynote, and then I was one of the speakers. And so I really appreciate what Deepak Chopra has to say, which is that the greatest leaders look inward and able to tell a good story with authenticity, authenticity and passion. And so that's the second thing that I believe is really important. And so a lot of different presenters that get paid millions, like <laughs> Deepak Chopra, some of the best presenters in the the world will tell you your story or sharing a story or an anecdote really helps your audience to be able to connect so if you have passion and you have a story a story that they're able to share in that experience um, then that's going to tie them to the main message in every presentation you have to remember that most um, most research shows they're only going to take away three points that's it, that each audience, remember, can only remember three key points. So when creating your uh, your story or creating that presentation, try to think what is the three things, the three takeaways I want them that I think are the most important, and then make sure that you really highlight those. You can present other ideas as well. That's that I do that all the time. But you want to see what is the three takeaways that you really want your audience um, to connect with and be able to share a story about one of them or all three of them. I found this article on Sparkle, um, S-P-A-R-K-O-L.com, and you can find the link when you go to um, MichelleTerrell.com presentations, and I did include it in there because I think it's a fascinating, brilliant article. It's about the eight different classic storytelling techniques. Um, and they show you Ted, not only do, does it do, do this really cool visual, so it tells you the name of that technique, the mountain. And then it gives you this diagram of how the story goes, you know, the follow of the story. So here we would have, of course, if you know about English and you know about storytelling and um, the story, we know that there's a climax. So. That's what it's showing you. It's going through that kind of, you know, um, that path and like the story, you know, path of a story. And so you have here the climax. This is the climax conflict. And then here we go, the finale. So it tells you, you know, the buildup. This is the buildup climbing. So this one particular technique, it, it shows you a visual of each of the eight storytelling. Here's in media ray. Here's the mountain. And then not only does it do that, it says it gives you three quick tips. It tells you what it's good for. And then it shows you uh, an example video of someone using that storytelling. So I think it's a fantastic resource. Um, and I tried to share it a few times on Twitter because I get so excited by that article. I think it's just so smart and helpful. Focus on a few points. Um, like I said, the audience only remembers three points. And so it's important that we don't just bog them down with each point. And what I mean by focus is make sure that these are the ones that stick out. These are the key ones, you know. So you can have several points, but the focus, what you give attention to, what you give the story to, what maybe you focus on the presentation on um, with the visuals is what's important um, because that's what they're going to take away. Audience participation is important. Now, if you're giving a keynote or you're giving a plenary, that's a little bit difficult. And the reason why that can be difficult is because you only have a set number of time. Or if you have, for example, a limited amount of time. So let's say you're presenting in five, five minutes. We have pachacutas or five minutes. You're not always going to have audience participation if it's short. But if it's longer than, you know, if it's 30 minutes or longer, then you do want to get uh, some audience participation. And the way that you can do that can be very quick. So in my keynote, what I try to do is I'll have the audience members do something like, 
stand if you believe in this and then we'll have those moments or there can be where you know we have um one technique that i've done is where i've gotten a few members of the audience to come up and demonstrate a point for two minutes and then they sit back down and so that's still audience participation because it it changes things up and that's this is a really working on attention span because um, after, you know, most adults can sit through uh, 30 minutes and be fine. But then after that, they start getting antsy. Things, it could be as much as uh, with audience participation could also be having a, a back channel you can have where, you know, you have a, where you invite them to just, um, you know, you send them a hashtag and tell them to add their comment. It could be a poll. There's lots and lots of ways to have audience participation and so i think that it's it's really um a great way to do that um is to have a poll and then they can answer all of that and then you can show them the poll results live with poll anywhere i mean there's a lot of different uh polling places out there um that'll get that live and that doesn't take a lot of time away from your presentation at all or if they're tweeting you know then that's a great way to get them to do because it's all going in the Twitter stream of the conference hashtag. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, and then Peggy says, there's also when presenters say, turn and share to the person sitting next to you. Another way that I've gotten audiences to participate is that I've also gotten audiences to be able to, um, to take out their mobile devices and share a picture and talk about it for like a minute or two. So that's a way that I get them and then that's it and then they go back out or I get the audience to raise their mobile devices or do a mobile um, device activity and those are actually in my book learning to go and they're also on my website and in fact I was at a conference recently learning in the brain and I saw a speaker use my activity he didn't give me any uh, credit for it but they did use that activity um, <laughs> which has been in my book for the past four or five years so um, but it's okay. At least these techniques are going around um, and even big uh, presenters are using them as well. So that's good. <laughs> um, design engaging slides. And so especially with this presentation, I try to make sure that the slides and the font um, were different. And so it's not, it's everyone has. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, design slides, you know, uh, some people get really particular about the format, the font, making sure all the colors uh, really resemble each other. I don't do that. I make sure each slide is visually pleasing, but it's not that all of them have a uniform um, kind of quality. And some believe that or all of them have the same font in every because it's really hard to do that sometimes. Um, but these are some good tips. Less is more. Back to that focus on a few points. Notice how there's not a lot of bullet points. There's not a whole bunch of text. And so that's really important. I've been to some presentations. I remember being at Tiesel Grace. And I went to a presentation. And it was a great topic. Um, it was uh, research and how the teacher was um, did this uh, wonderful research where, and this was back in, I think it was in 2009 or, yeah, it was very early, um, had gotten her teacher candidates to use Messenger to be able to offer a support group and do the research. It was a wonderful, fascinating topic. I really wanted to see how it impacted, but she spent <laughs> hours um, with lots and lots of um, words and, and quotes from Dewey and uh, research statistics that she it, she ran out of time to actually get to the good part of the presentation. So it's really important, especially if you're at a research conference and you are saying your research, make the research succeed. That's not what's important. What's important is what was a discovery and that's what people are gonna wanna know. They're gonna wanna know what was the, the main point of uh, you know, what did you find out? Was it a successful project? How did that project illuminate, you know, how we can do something better or, you know, identify a problem area we had? And so I really wanted to know about that research. And, you know, I'm pretty sure it went well, but she wasn't ever able to get to it. So remember, less is more. One idea per slide. Don't put um, a whole bunch of words. 
Quotes are a little bit different. Yes, you can put a whole quote in one or a whole, you know, lines of a poem. Um, that's fine. That that works with some presentations. I know David Crystal will do that sometimes. He'll have a whole entire, like, you know, um, parts of a poem, but he's presenting. He's actually acting out what is there. So that's, you know, for some instances, you'll have that. But, um, you know, want, you want to make sure that you do use... Um, for the most part, that you try to avoid having several bullet points and put that in each slide. You can quickly go through each one as well. So you can see here how I'm changing it up. The other thing is when you're designing slides, um, high quality images, I use pixabay.com. I don't recommend it for kids. It has some um, questionable material, so I don't, re but for adults, I definitely recommend it, you know, I get great slides from there, great, they're getting more diversity as well, which I think is really important, you want to make sure, yes, and that is, the text on the slide reinforces what you are hearing, as um, Peggy and George is saying, yes, make sure that it doesn't contrast, um, notice how I, you also play with, um, when you're talking about creativity, play with what the audience, so, the reason why you want to design slides in a way is because you want the audience to keep the attention during the whole time. So your slides can be a way to really make their brains, even though if they're sitting down most of the time, to be able to make them snap. So notice how first we have it over here. This is where the words are. And then I've played it up and I've put the focus over here. So if you do surprising things with your slides, then that really makes the audience and the brain work harder and that keeps them paying attention. Um, what I've seen is that how some will take out the whole entire picture and maybe just have her face and then afterwards, you know, have the whole background. So there's a lot of ways that you can really play around with your slides and be creative to be able to keep the audience's attention. Pixabay.com, I already said that. Uh, Pick Wizard's a new one. Um, Pick Wizard, I haven't found a lot on. They have high quality. Um, I find that they have less search results, so I stick to Pixabay. Pixabay always um, happens to be uh, help me out, but Pick Wizard does have free stock photos. This site is a little bit more safer for kids. I haven't seen anything questionable on this site yet, so um, this could be a great thing for a project as well. I don't think that it, it necessarily shows. Um, as many, many pictures under the category, but um, you know, picks a base better. than that, but, but if you are using it with students to pick Windsor would definitely be a good option. I would say to keep audience questions at the end. And I saw really. Good presenter. I it. Temple. 
and one of the points um, um, that I want to make here is your time you spend a lot of money 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 to go to travel um sometimes President, a conference is will pay. You do you present so that one good idea uh, uh, or reason. for presenting because you can get into a lot of conferences for free. But, but, you know, that time is valuable, not that's all you get. And so if you lack how questions throughout your presence. presentation a hey it is it 
interrupts your flow. It makes it to where, you know, you practice, you plan so much to have this flow, you maybe practice in the mirror, maybe you got your timing right, everything. If you take questions within, that completely throws it off. You cannot prepare for every question. And when I saw a presentation from a very good presenter who just happened to want to try this dogma approach to his presentation, he said, um, there was a lot of write-ups about it because he ended up not presenting after all. And it, it actually was quite a disaster. And the reason it was a disaster is because the audience took over the presentation and it became a big argument. You are always going to have that one audience member that wants to go on and on with their question. Maybe they don't get to present or maybe that's just the way they are and they want to monopolize your time. So even if you only say five minutes, they can, this, even if not everyone gets to answer the question, you get to answer the question, this is a good time to invite them. Connect with me on social media. Connect with me after. Email me. You know, that way they are uh, forced to get in contact with you after and to be able to, you can answer those questions even more. And then you have time to be able to get, I know a lot of times when I'm at a conference, Yes, things come to my mind, but really I need to be at the computer looking at my bookmarks to be able to get them the information they need. So always, you know, I think email is still a great, I allow my um, audience to, to leave their email. I even encourage them. I say they get a free copy of my book, Learning to Go. And so, um, or something, you know, anything that I, I can give them, they get the slides, they get all the bookmarks in an easy way. Anything to encourage them to add their email because a lot of teachers still use email as their main mode of communication. They appreciate it. Even though it takes me a little bit of time, sometimes I have hundreds of emails, I'll be able to go and, and I do it. And then um, those, um, you know, they'll stay connected, they'll look at materials and things like that. Have a plan B because things don't always go right, especially with the technology. And so it's important that you're able to keep that time a well spent. Um, people, you don't want them to walk away remembering, oh, you know, they had a lot of problems or you want them to walk away with your message. So you can, I've seen presenters, one of the best presenters I've ever seen, who was magnificent, had teachers crying, everything like that is Principal L. Principal L is on Twitter and he presented with no slides and he was only himself talking, and he <laughs> did an amazing presentation. So believe in yourself, if you're really passionate, if you have that story, if you've read that Sparkle article and you know the story, then you can present and not have slides, not have technology and all that, and be ready to do that, because I have been to some presentations where uh, nothing worked, not even the slide projector, and we were still able to do it, thankfully. <laughs> But it did, you know, um, um, it, you know, it was good. We had a plan B. Provide a copy of your presentation. Make sure that your presentation is available for others somewhere, whether it's through a website, whether you're willing to email them the slides. But just give a copy of your presentation. If you're worried about people taking your presentation, I don't worry about that. I know I've had people in Argentina. I've had people in Brazil and people all over the world tell me, um, by the way, uh, you know, they're presenting with some of your slides. You can't avoid if people are going to steal your material. You're just not able to do that if you're a presenter and if you want lots of people to be able to see what you do. What I know is this, is that, you know, I have put my name, um, make sure to put your name on your slides so that's less likely to happen. Add them as pictures and put them as image shots. It's a lot harder. You know, the person has to do a lot of work to be able to crop out my name and things like that. That's why you see that I present as PDFs. Send them a PDF. I send PDFs a lot because it's really difficult to be able to, you know, take out. you got to go through a lot of work to steal my slides. <laughs> They're PDFs to make them into a slide presentation. And so that's the tips I would give you. But I know that I've had a lot more benefits by having my information everywhere than I have by people stealing. That hasn't really hurt me that much. So 
but those are ways to make sure. Um, dress confidently and comfortably. So whatever is you do, make sure not to go ahead and to have your, um, make sure that you're not going to have to, uh, you know, especially with women, it, it's difficult for us because we have to dress in a certain way that looks professional. And I do believe that, you know, I, I do believe there are high expectations that we look well um, because we look professional. Uh, I think guys don't have that as much. I've seen guys go in in sneakers and things and really be able to wow an audience and people think he's cool. I've seen that less uh, work less uh, with women. <laughs> but wear comfortable shoes. So I usually have... Um, you know, even if I present my keynotes with heels uh, right after, I know it's so unfair on TV, definitely. But um, so I always bring flats uh, and sandals afterwards, and I immediately put them on after <laughs> my. Um, no, I believe it's unfair. I don't think it's fair. Um, but um, I immediately put my, you know, my shoes and everything on afterwards, you know, the comfortable, and they're still nice, but they're realistic and practical yet. Um, then, you know, so you can, you don't necessarily have to have like, I, I know some presenters go all out and that's them, you know, um, they'll have, um, they'll have $400 shoes or a $400 dress and, you know, look the part, especially if they're keynote or plenary, but you know, you can, you can dress nice. You can wear, you know, women can wear pantsuits. I've seen lots of women wear pantsuits and just wear a jacket over. And then they can take that jacket off after and look, you know, very professional with the jacket on, take it off. And then they still look good. So there are a lot of ways to dress comfortably. And because when you go to a conference, a lot of times, especially in my next tip, you want to be able to connect and go right after. You want to be able to either you know, attend events. So it could be all day that you're there. And if you're there all day, then it's, I've had shoes that will mess me up the entire day, make me miserable and make it harder for me to connect and have a really good time. So it's important that we dress comfortably. Um, attend meetups and events. So it, you know, really the experience is more than you presenting. And sometimes uh, I get so wrapped up in the presenting and then I, I, you know, someone will say, go here. And then I have a great time going somewhere, even though at the time I think, oh, I've got to prepare. I got to. So take time because really it's those experiences that are going to make that conference great. At the end of the day, um, meeting up with people and, and that's where you're really going to get feedback too. So after your conference, you may not get that, oh, that went well, because there's another presenter coming. But at a meetup, someone might come up to you and say, hey, that's where I get a lot of feedback. I really appreciated what you told me or I really liked your presentation. And so it's really great um, to be able to uh, be able to connect with people afterwards and, and have further conversations about what's happening. Um, the other thing. Um, OK, so I think Alina asked a question. I didn't see it, so sorry about that. Can you rewrite that, Alina? <laughs> uh, connect on social media, because if you're able to, then you're able to add them to your personal learning, professional learning network. And then you're able to answer questions further. And you're seen as a thought leader that way. Uh, it's also really great because then you can learn from them. You can see what resources. What I think is that you should always look at the conference hashtag. So many um, hashtags now, conferences have hashtags. And what happens is that the conference is able to um, even have Twitter chats. I've seen some conferences. So participate that in ahead of time. Start sharing. Start looking at who's on the hashtag. That's what I do before I go do a keynote or any kind of question now is that I'll look at the hashtag and I'll any presentation I'll I'll start um, following those people first I follow I retweet and then I start sharing and then I start saying I'm looking forward and I use that conference hashtag before I even get to the conference so I've already made connections with those specific people they know my material and they feel a relationship with me already so that's something that you can do Afterwards, share your slides and materials using the hashtags. You know, make sure people encourage people to uh, take pictures, put selfies, whatever from your presentation, and add them. So that way, when they see they they and if you ever present there again or in that 
city or area, people know, hey, they had a lot of fun in that presentation. That's someone I want to see next. So the hashtag is so, um, so important. So Alina said, what is the quality of the presentation, the high hill, <laughs> the connection? I don't know, but what I do know is this, is that if they're filming, especially for someone like me that it's short, it does look more, uh, I look more, what do you, is confident. So if you're taller, if you're, it forces your form, um, and that's what makes a great presenter as well is confidence. So um, that's the other thing is, is, is I think when it comes to attire, if you look comfortably, um, that's why shoulder pads were so important is that in pictures and stuff, if you take a look and you see between someone who doesn't have like um, that professional attire versus someone who does, you'll notice that the one with the heels or that's taller or has higher, you know, that, that look, it looks more confident. And so I think that that's what it is. They look also more powerful. And so that's what it is, um, is during pictures. So if you're filming or pictures, um, then that's, that's the difference I've noticed. And that's why I'll continue to wear the heels because I've had presentations where I wore the flat shoes and I looked a little dowdy. Um, I don't know if you know what the word dowdy is, but I didn't look as confident. I didn't look as um, empowering. And that's really important, especially if you're a keynote. I think it's really important if you're a keynote or being filmed as a featured presenter. If you're being uh, filmed in any way or pictures, then you need to worry about that too because that's how other conferences book you. And so that's important. So there, and that's the good point is because maybe in the pictures it looked like that, but, you know, there have been times when I've taken my shoes off during a presentation because they hurt so much or something. So um, you never know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. that Those pictures don't tell it all. <laughs> um, use hashtags to share and connect with the, and so hopefully you got that part, um, the conference, Twitter their chats related and so sometimes what I should note about hashtags if you're going to conference and this is especially if you're a featured presenter or anything like that or if you have a book or you have anything you're trying to sell then you really do or you just want to be someone who has a high audience because you think that you have um really good material to share and you just really like helping others if they don't have a conference um hashtag which is very rare at uh, most conferences today have that pretty much all that I've been to even very small ones even ed camps have hashtags for them um if they don't have a twitter chat associated then you can always look up related hashtags um to that conference hashtag and find there even if there's not a twitter chat for that conference there's a twitter chat for the area the conference is in so that's what's very important as well I think that you're able to have, um, you know, that connection. And because more than likely, at most conferences, local people go. So, for example, I'm going to be presenting a keynote um, uh, twice um, this uh, in 2018 in New Jersey. If one of the conferences does not have a conference hashtag, there is 